Well, in your clinical career, you're going to come across situations where you're not quite sure what to do. It might be a situation after an accident, for example, and there seems to be about six things wrong with the patient. There might be a bone sticking out from somewhere. There might be blood leaking out from various places. And it can be a bit overwhelming. You're not quite sure where to start. Well, in every situation you're ever going to find yourself in, the priorities are always the same. The priorities in emergency care and after trauma are always A, B, C, D and E. You always follow the same procedure. And A is for airway with cervical spine protection. So the first priority in any trauma emergency situation is to make sure that the patient has a patent airway, that the airway is open and that the cervical spine is protected. Absolutely fundamental, A for airway and cervical spine control. The B is for breathing. Once the airway is patent, air must be going in and out of the airway into the patient's lungs. So once the airway is patent and the cervical spine is protected, you go on to make sure that the patient is breathing. If the patient is not breathing, they're going to need ventilated in some way. So the B is for breathing and ventilation. That's your next priority to sort out. C is for circulation and hemorrhage control. You've got to make sure that the patient's circulatory system is functioning properly and that any bleeding is arrested. Because obviously if there's no blood circulating around the body, the patient will die fairly quickly. So A, B, C, C for circulation and hemorrhage control. They're always your first priorities. A, B, C. A, then B, then C. Now the D stands for disability. This is your assessment of the neurological status of the patient. Now sometimes this might be done very quickly with an AVPU assessment. A is alert that the patient spontaneously opens their eyes and looks at you when you approach. V is for voice that the patient responds to you talking to them. P is that the patient responds when you inflict a painful stimuli on them. And U means that the patient is unresponsive. But this is altogether rather crude. So what we advise in most A&E situations is that you do a GCS, a Glasgow Coma Scale. And the big advantage of doing a GCS assessment is you get a number from 3 to 15. And that means that you can assess the level of consciousness of the patient. And perhaps even more importantly, you can decide whether that level of consciousness is increasing or decreasing. Because it's very important to know the trend in the Glasgow Coma Scale. A, B, C, D. The E is for exposure. Traumatized patients need to be completely exposed but we do need to prevent hypothermia, that's very important. So we need to prevent hypothermia, but we do need to see all the surface of the patient's body so they can be assessed. E for exposure. Detect and monitor other injuries. And this allows us to consider further care that might be required. And also it allows us to promote the comfort of the patient. So A, B, C, D, E. This is what we call the primary survey. A, B, C, D, E is the primary survey. And during the primary survey, life-threatening conditions are identified and managed simultaneously. In other words, if you identify a problem with the airway, you will manage that situation as soon as you've identified it. Then you'll go on to B. If there's a problem with breathing and ventilation, you'll manage that situation, you'll do something about it to make sure the patient is being ventilated, and then you'll go on to C. If there's a problem with C, a problem with the circulation, like there's blood spurting out of the patient's leg or whatever it is, you'll manage that hemorrhage, and then you'll go on to D. If there's a problem with D, you'll manage that and then go on to E.
So major problems should be corrected as they are identified in that order. That is the nature of the primary survey. You are surveying the patient's airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure and you are treating whatever is thrown up during that phase of the assessment, whatever is identified during that phase of the primary survey. Now let's look at the components of the primary survey in a little more detail. Let's start with A with C spine protection, airway with cervical spinal protection. So first of all, we assess the patency of the airway. And we can do this by looking, listening and feeling. So a good idea here, if you're in any doubt as to whether the patient's airway is open, is to put your ear down near the patient's nose. And then you can feel if there's any air going in and out of the patient's mouth and nose, because your ear is very sensitive and you can feel the flow of air. And also that allows you to listen for any air going in and out of the patient's mouth as well. And obviously, if there's air going in and out of the patient's mouth, the airway must be patent. And at the same time, if you have your ear down near the patient's nose, you can look at the patient's chest and see if there's any chest movements, if there's any chest excursion, the movements of the chest up and down. So these things will allow us to assess the patency of the airway. Now, if the airway is not open, we need to consider opening the airway to allow air in and out of the airway, because the airway is completely useless if it's blocked. That's the first thing that's going to threaten your life of the patient. And we can open the airway in different ways. If we're fairly satisfied that the patient has not suffered any injury, if they've just fainted or they're unconscious for some medical reason, then we can extend the neck and put the patient up in what's called the sniffing the morning air position, putting the head up. The, putting the chin up and that will have the effect of opening the airway but if there's any question that the person might have damaged their cervical spine we need to stabilize their cervical spine and in this case it might be necessary to use what is called the jaw thrust maneuver now in this maneuver the fingers of the rescuer are put behind the angle of the jaw not at the bottom part of the jaw but behind the angle of the jaw and the jaw is pulled forward it's as if you're trying to make the bottom teeth protrude out over the top teeth. And this will pull the tongue away and it will open the pharynx to allow the air in, the jaw thrust procedure. And also at this stage, it might be necessary to consider using airway adjuncts. An adjunct is anything that helps to keep the airway open. For example, you might use a nasopharyngeal airway through the nose into the patient's pharynx. You might decide to use an oropharyngeal airway from through the mouth into the patient's pharynx. Or you might decide to use something like a, lar a laryngeal mask, or even you might go for endotracheal intubation at that stage. So that's thinking about the airway, but of course it's airway with C-spine protection. Now any traumatized patient, especially if they've bashed their head or have fallen or been involved in an accident where there's been quite a lot of trauma, it's possible that they've damaged their cervical vertebrae, especially if the patient's unconscious and can't tell you if they've got a sore neck. So in any traumatized patient, you have to assume they, are, they have damage to their cervical vertebrae until that's proved otherwise. Because, of course, the cervical spinal cord goes through the cervical vertebrae. The first seven vertebrae are the cervical vertebrae. C1, C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then the first thoracic vertebrae is T1. So we have to assume that there is an injury here until proved otherwise. Because a patient might have a fractured cervical vertebrae and the spinal cord, the cervical spinal cord might be perfectly intact. But because there is a fracture to the to a cervical vertebrae, then that means that the cervical part of the vertebral column is unstable. And if the patient's moved injudiciously or moved inappropriately in any way, 
a fracture line may destabilize. And that might mean that the broken ends of the bone can cut through the patient's cervical spinal cord. And if that happens, there'll be a transverse lesion across the patient's cervical cord. And that means that the patient won't feel or be able to move anything below the level of that lesion ever again. So we have to be very careful to protect it. And to do this on receipt of a casualty, we can immediately stabilize the C-spine by putting our hands on either side of the patient's head. But then we must use the trinity of protection. And there are three components to this, as the name would imply. The first component is the cervical collar, which must be correctly sized to the patient's neck and fitted around about reasonably tightly. The next component are the blocks that go at the side of the patient's head to stop the patient from moving their head from side to side. The third component is that we tape the patient's head down onto the transfer trolley or onto the spinal board or whatever the patient happens to be on. So the three components of cervical spine immobilization are firstly the cervical spinal collar, secondly the blocks at the side of the head, and thirdly the tape that holds the head down. Now this isn't saying that the rest of the spinal cord is not important, of course it is. There could equally be fractures to the thoracic or lumbar vertebrae. But the cervical vertebrae are most at risk because heads wobble around if patients are unconscious if we move patients improperly. And patients might even try and move heads on their own voluntarily both of which we should stop until we can ascertain whether there is in fact any damage to the cervical spine or not. Still thinking about the airway, we can identify potential obstructions of the airway. Vomit, for example, can obstruct the airway. If the patient vomits when they're lying on their back and they're unconscious, the vomit has nowhere to go and can be aspirated into the trachea and aspirated into the lungs. This will cause obstruction of the airway in the acute situation. And even if the patient survives, then vomit will have been inhaled down into the bronchial tree and that will result in future aspiration pneumonia. And a patient who's inhaled vomit is very ill and may not survive that insult. Foreign material might be in the trachea or bronchial passages. This could be uh, soil or dirt after a road traffic accident. It could be food. And if possible, these things can be cleared from the airway. This is why suction is particularly useful. That can help you to clear the airway. And if the airway is obstructed or likely to become obstructed, a definitive airway should be established. So a definitive airway is one which makes the airway patent and also one which protects the airway against the possibility of aspiration of material in the future. And really, the only definitive airway, well, I suppose there's two definitive airways, really. One is the endotracheal tube, if the patient, the patient will need endotracheal intubation, where a cuff can be inflated, because the tube will let the air in and out, and the inflated cuff will protect the airway. And likewise, a surgical cricothyroidotomy will also allow a patent lumen in and out of the trachea and the cuff can also be blown up to protect the airway. So a definitive airway should be established if there's any doubt that the patient can maintain their own airway. For example, if a patient's GCS is 8 or below, they should receive a definitive airway because they may well not be able to maintain their own airway. So if the GCS is 8 or less, the patient should be intubated to establish a definitive airway. The saying is less than 8, then intubate. It also might be worth considering gastric catheters with suction to decompress the stomach if there's a significant risk of uh, aspiration. So establish a patent airway with cervical spine protection. With cervical spine protection with survival.